Now, I want to move on to Dr. Jaffe, who has been very patient uh, to this point, um, to discuss um, with us the uh, nature and the importance of the autopsy, um, what goes on in the performance of an autopsy, uh, the techniques of the autopsy, the external examination, uh, setting a time of death, and the various things that go into that, uh, and to discuss with us the role of the pathologist, uh, uh, his usefulness to the defense, uh, creating or assisting in the presentation of a theory of the defense, or some position that supports the accused statement as to what occurred, um, and also to uh, tell us briefly what other reports from other experts assist him in the preparation of his opinion, and um, to look at uh, what the Center of Forensic Sciences is in the province of Ontario. Five minutes, Dr. Jaffe. <laughs> <laughs> How many hours have I got to cover this? Um, the, um, the pathological investigation of, of homicide uh, is a very recent development, really, in historical terms. It's about 150 years old. Uh, before that, when somebody, if somebody died violently, somebody would look at the body, usually the coroner, and he'd make a diagnosis, and that was that. About uh, the 30s and 40s of the last century, uh, it, uh, the need was felt for a more detailed uh, examination of the body. And medical men were then brought into the picture, physicians who were interested in the anatomy of the body and the effects of violence on the body. And these examined the body in greater detail. They not only examined it externally, they opened the body and examined the organs systematically. And they were called pathologic anatomists in those days. And they're now called pathologists. And uh, when the microscope came into common use about the turn of the century, they also employed the microscope to study the details of the uh, tissue and organ changes. Uh, during the first hundred years of this period, um, the pathologist usually kept a little bench in the back of his study uh, on which he could carry out simple chemical tests for arsenic and strychnine and uh, mercury and some of the common poisons. Homicidal poisoning was common in those days. It's very rare these days. But in those days it was common, although the number of poisons to which the public had access wasn't really very great, it was about a few dozen. Well, things have changed a little since that time. Although the pathologist is still the central figure, as it were, in the medical investigation of homicide because he is the one who examines the body, internally and externally. <coughs> he is the one who tries to determine the cause of death. And he is usually the main medical witness of the prosecution. He may be called to the scene, as uh, Inspector Tyrell has, uh, has mentioned. If he is, that's a very useful experience <coughs> to the pathologist, although he usually doesn't do much except look at the scene, look at the surroundings, and get an impression of the uh, general uh, um, state of affairs. Uh, he doesn't want to interfere with the police investigation. And the only thing he sometimes would like to do and does do is take the body temperature. But apart from that, uh, he usually just observes. Now. Things have become more complicated in all phases of human activity, and uh, nowadays when the pathologist uh, suspects that uh, a case may involve a poison or a drug, the number of possibilities is almost infinite. There may be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of different drugs which may be involved, and he'll be quite out of his, his uh, depth. So he tends to employ the services of a toxicologist. A toxicologist is a chemist, uh, usually not medically trained, but he's a chemist who specializes in the detection of 
drugs and other noxious substances in biological materials such as blood, urine, stomach contents, tissues, and so on. And the toxicologist usually also who determines alcohol levels of various body fluids. If um, blood stains are to be examined, blood grouping to be done, he usually refers to the uh, um, biological or the forensic biologist. <laughs> Inspector Tyrell has already mentioned the example of cigarette butts, which may contain blood group substances. Very few pathologists would undertake this sort of work themselves these days uh, if forensic biologists are available. They also examine other stains, such as seminal stains, sweat stains, hairs, fibers, vaginal washings, anal swabs, and things of that kind. The number and variety of firearms and ammunition is so great these days that the pathologist would not, uh, it would exceed his own personal experience. So firearms examiners or ballistics experts are uh, usually referred, uh, are usually employed to uh, explore some aspects of the shooting. The pathologist will still uh, study the injuries are caused by firearms. He will secure the e entrance wounds for the examination of powder residues. He will recover bullets and bullet fragments, but it's the firearms examiner who will then uh, more closely identify these uh, specimens. Um, the examination of teeth is now again something which is extremely complex and beyond the experience of the pathologist. As a pathologist, I can recognize various types of teeth. Uh, I can distinguish probably the permanent teeth from the deciduous teeth, uh, but uh, subtle differences such as uh, sex and race <coughs> characteristics of teeth, I think I would refer to an odontologist. I could certainly recognize bite marks on the skin. I've seen many of them. But then to match these bite marks with the dentition of a suspect, I think gets to be pretty tricky, and one would refer this to a, an odontologist. Sometimes other experts have to be employed. Uh, the weatherman, the meteorologist, uh, in cases of exposed bodies, the entomologist or insect uh, expert in cases of uh, identification of maggots and so on. But the common uh, forensic scientists are the toxicologist, the ballistics expert, the biologist, and sometimes the odontologist. Now, before I leave this subject, I, I may just refer uh, to the Center of Forensic Sciences, which is here in, in Toronto, and which is a forensic laboratory which supplies these scientific services to the province of Ontario. Um, it's just located a few blocks from here. It's a provincial laboratory under the Solicitor General. They supply all the services except pathology. Pathology is a, a separate uh, department. Uh, they also supply other uh, scientific services which are not directly related to pathology, such as question documents, um, examination of motor vehicles, although that may be related to pathology and hit and run problems and so on. Now, we're very fortunate to have this laboratory in, in Ontario. There's only one other province which has a similar institution, and that is Quebec. Uh, there's a forensic uh, institute in Montreal. Uh, the other Canadian uh, provinces and territories have to rely upon the uh, laboratories of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Now, these are very good laboratories, but there are not many of them, and not all of them provide all the range of services. So. Um, may be necessary to employ several of these laboratories to uh, get certain things done. Uh, these are located, the RCMP laboratories are located in Halifax and in Sackville, New Brunswick to service the entire east part of Canada and the eastern Arctic. There's one in Ottawa, one in Regina, one in Winnipeg, one in Regina, one in Edmonton, and uh, one in Vancouver. Now, um, what is a pathologist? <clears throat> I've already touched on this. A pathologist is a medical person who specializes 
in the effects of disease and violence upon the body, upon the various organs and tissues of the body. And you can perhaps uh, more closely define a forensic pathologist as a pathologist who studies the effect of violence on bodies. Uh, the term violence being used in its broadest term to include such things as drugs, poison, <coughs> electricity, uh, um, drowning, and all those things. Now, the pathologist performs autopsies. What's an autopsy? And I might say autopsy, necropsy, uh, post-mortem examination, they all mean the same thing. One can only define this very loosely. An autopsy is an examination of human remains, uh, both with the naked eye, or grossly, as we say, as the pathologists call it, or microscopically. And it usually involves um, measurements, uh, weighing of organs, and other supplementary determinations. It's difficult to, f to define an autopsy more closely because its nature and its technique naturally depend very much upon the type of case one is dealing with. Whether one is dealing with a fresh body, whether one is dealing with uh, uh, a skeleton or uh, fragmentary remains or a burnt body, the techniques vary very greatly and it's difficult uh, to, to <coughs> generalize. Now, um, Today we are talking about homicide. So how does a pathologist contribute to the investigation of homicide? He contributes by trying to answer certain questions on the basis of his autopsy. And the first question he usually tries to answer is, whose body is it? Now, this may be the easiest thing in the world. Uh, Inspector Tyrell has said, somebody may step up to the body and say, this is the body of Mary Jones, and that, that, that's the end of that. Or uh, the determination of the identity may belong to some of the most formidable problems in forensic medicine. Uh, many of you will remember the case of Dr. Harvey Crippen in 1912, who was accused of killing his wife. And his wife's body was represented by a small piece of fat and skin from the abdominal wall. And the whole question of the identity of the victim revolved around this little piece of uh, partly decomposed uh, fat. More recent case, uh, what many of you will know, was that of, George, of John George Haig in England in 48, who dissolved his victims in, in nitric acid. And, uh, as you can imagine, that caused some difficulties. Um, uh, and not all uh, cases are that spectacular, but the, the, obviously the identity of the body is a, is a very uh, a crucial point. Sometimes, of course, the pathologist has to be even more basic than this, and the first question he has to answer is, are the remains of human origin? If they are of human origin, uh, how many individuals are represented? That comes up uh, very often in cases of dismemberment, <coughs> uh, in cases of uh, bodies destroyed by fire, and so on. Having established the identity, or at least the type of individual uh, the body represents, the next very important question, of course, is the cause of death. What killed this individual? Again, this may be the easiest thing in the world. It may be a, a bullet through the head. Or it may be, again, a very formidable uh, uh, job. Um, the more decomposed the body, the more incomplete the body, naturally, the more <coughs> difficult it is to determine the cause of death. A stab wound through the heart is no longer there if the heart has disappeared. So that when we deal with skeletons, uh, all soft tissue injuries have disappeared, and only those involving bones or the skull may still be evident. And finally, even, and I like to bring this out, even in fresh bodies, uh, there are causes of death which are not demonstrable at autopsy, including uh, homicidal causes of death, such as, um, as smothering which is uh, sometimes an impossible thing to establish uh, at autopsy, and uh, 
the pathologist may have to go by a process of exclusion, which is never a happy situation. Having established the cause of death, the next question he tries to answer usually are the circumstances which brought about the cause of death. If there's a fractured skull, which undoubtedly was the cause of death, uh, how did the skull become fractured? Was it a fall? Was it a blow? If it was a blow, what type of instrument was employed? Was it one blow? Was it several? Um, which came first? Which came later? From which direction did they come? Now, the time of death. When did the individual die? This is, a, uh, this is an old chestnut, and uh, it doesn't come up very often in, in homicide trials, but when it does come up, it, it may be extremely important. Uh, the classical example, of course, being the Truscott case. The whole case revolved around the time of death. Now, um, <clears throat> I don't want to go into the various uh, methods um, because this will take a lot of time. The reason it is so difficult to determine the time of death is that all methods to determine the time of death are based upon an erroneous assumption. The assumption is that as soon as death occurs, certain post-mortem changes start, and they proceed in a perfectly regular and predictable manner. So when the pathologist sees a dead body, all he has to do is see what stage the post-mortem changes have reached, and he can calculate the time of death. Well, this assumption incorporates a number of errors. First of all, the post-mortem changes do not start immediately after death. Some do and some don't. <coughs> they do not proceed in a perfectly predictable manner. They are notoriously capricious and unpredictable so that the determination of the time of death is a very difficult and very uncertain thing. I don't want to go into the details, but just to give you a, a, an idea of the degree of precision a pathologist can expect to attain. In the ter first 12 hours after death, and now I'm speaking about, of course, a very fresh, well-preserved body, in the first 12 hours, he can usually estimate the time plus or minus two hours. After 24 hours, plus or minus four hours. After two days, plus or minus six hours, and after a week, plus or minus a day. That's the degree of precision one can expect. And that only applies to bodies in, other, in sort of ordinary circumstances. It doesn't apply to bodies floating in water or bodies frozen outside, uh, in which case it's totally impossible to pinpoint the time of death. The nature of wounds and the age of wounds is an obviously important thing to be explored at autopsy. Were certain wounds inflicted, or could they have been inflicted by a certain instrument? Uh, which wounds came first? How old are they? Um, could they have been self-inflicted? Uh, these type of questions frequently arise. A survival, the, a survival of the um, individual following the receipt of a um, potentially lethal injury uh, frequently occurs, and the questions arise, how soon after receiving the injury did death occur? And could the deceased have carried out certain acts during that so-called survival time? After having been stabbed through the heart, could the deceased have walked 500 yards up the street, <coughs> gone up some stairs, unlocked the door before collapsing in the hall? This is a very frequent type of problem. Uh, the uh, um, detection of recent sexual activity, especially in females, uh, is an obviously important thing. Um, and this uh, usually involves uh, not only the pathologist, but the, uh, the forensic uh, biologist. Now, this is a, a very rough sketch of the scope of the pathologist in the investigation of a homicide. Um, our chairman has asked me to comment also briefly on the uh, 
role the pathologist may play in aiding the defense. Uh, this is my, uh, one of my favorite subjects, and I'll, I'll try and condense this just into two or three minutes. Um, for the defense to employ a pathologist nowadays uh, is fortunately a, a more common practice than it used to be. The uh, crown pathologist uh, is an expert in a rather esoteric field. He deals in concepts which are um, unfamiliar to non-medical people. He usually speaks in a language which is difficult to understand for a non-medical person. And the uh, ways in which the, the uh, pathologist can aid the defense, of course, are fairly obvious. Um, by interpreting the, um, the evidence presented by the Crown. Now, one of the um, greatest contributions the uh, pathologist can make to, to in aiding the defense is to interpret the evidence of the Crown pathologist in a certain way. <coughs> It's difficult for me to put this into words, but the crown pathologist will present what he believes is true, his conclusions on the basis of his autopsy findings. Now, if you examine, uh, you all have certain beliefs which you feel are true, but if you examine these beliefs, you will find that you hold different beliefs with different degrees of conviction. There are different degrees of certainty. And the same applies to the pathological evidence presented by the Crown. The pathologist, like any medical person, will hold certain beliefs with different degrees of convictions or different degrees of certainty. And the pathologist aiding the defense can detect areas of the least certainty or to put it the other way, of the greatest doubt which the pathologist entertains, the crown pathologist. <coughs> and by guiding the cross-examination away from areas in which the crown pathologist is on firm ground and guiding them towards these areas of least certainty or um, greatest doubt, I think the defense pathologist can make his greatest contribution. Um, his contribution, therefore, lies in guiding the cross-examination of the crown pathologist rather than giving expert evidence himself. I resist personally, um, as much as I can, the attempts of counsel to get <coughs> me to give expert evidence. And the reason for that is obvious, of course. The defense pathologist is basically on weak ground. He has not performed the autopsy. He has rarely seen the autopsy. His opinion is based on secondary sources. The autopsy report, uh, the photographs, uh, the lab reports, uh, sometimes the microscopic sections, but basically he is a second guesser. And um, the only time which I feel happy going on the stand myself to give expert evidence, if the crown pathologist has said something which is scientifically untenable, which sometimes happens, um, and I can um, contradict this. But otherwise, I think the secret of success of defense counsel lies in making the crown pathologist in effect, defense, defense witness, and I think that a, a pathologist can aid in, in, in accomplishing this. And I think I'll, I'll stop at this point. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Chaffee. Uh, Claire? Well, I had three things I wanted to comment uh, arising out of Dr. Jaffe's uh, very informative outline. There is a newer case, you know, uh, of the pathologist identifying a body, and if I recall, it's the Baron and Wurtzman case, is it not, Eddie? Uh, in fact, for a while, there was a traveling road show with the pathologist, Bob McGee as the crown, and the homicide officer uh, giving lectures on how the, the body uh, of the deceased was identified. And, you know, in the photographs of it, at least, they had very little more than what looked like some overcooked spare ribs. Yeah. 
and uh, it was a remarkable piece of, of forensic uh, puzzle building. Perhaps this deals more with the issue I believe will be touched upon uh, as to how one deals with expert witnesses, but I recall, and I come back to the case of, of uh, Mike Maldaver, probably one of the best presented defenses I ever faced. My pathologist, who was a man of repute, I was the crown, had taken a certain position <coughs> as to uh, the lack of powder burns, powder residue. And it involved a shot right through the eye. That was very important to my case and very disadvantageous to the crowns or to the defense, because the theory of the defense was that he had uh, had the gun in his hand uh, for reasons which were at least explicable when the deceased, his girlfriend, came running into the room, and uh, he, in a, in a spurt of joy, a relief at having her home got up and embraced her, and unfortunately the gun was in his hand and she plugged her through the eye, right? Well, I had a little difficulty with that given the lack of, of, of residue and, and so did Mike Maldaver until he broke my pathologist and break him he did. Uh, I know the next morning I was dictating an angry letter uh, and felt terribly let down, but really ultimately it was my responsibility. The pathologist had testified in a particular manner at the preliminary inquiry. I assumed, and I had no right to assume it, that the evidence would be given the same at trial, and Mike Maldaver conned this guy into saying that he had washed the tissue, uh, and God damn it, there went my residue. Uh, that is, before he examined it for residue. And it was, it was a brilliant piece of cross-examination. And really all I'm saying is that uh, while experts appear formidable, and are. They're usually learned pre people. They can be attacked, and one need not have fear, and one ought to go to their uh, evidence, through their evidence, very carefully. I think also in the matter of, of postmortems and the, the pathological investigation, it is important to understand it very well. I recall one murder case which I defended, uh, and in which I re ended up with a verdict of assault. Uh, having worked from <coughs> murder to manslaughter at the preliminary inquiry and manslaughter to assault at the trial because the cause of death became very much an issue. It involved a subdural hematoma. My client had given a savage beating to the uh, victim, but on the other hand, there were two subdural hematoma, one of long standing, and the issue of what had killed him just became one of reasonable doubt. And uh, I think you have to be very conscious of, of the cause of death that you course, outlined. Wally? Claire, on that case you mentioned of uh, the wound to the eye, was that a contact or was it alleged to be a contact wound? I alleged that it had happened from a distance of about 20 feet, okay, okay. Um, from across the room. And I, it was my view, Wally, I say this honestly, it was my view in that case that he did not intend to kill his girlfriend, but she came in in a tailored suit. He was involved in speed. Uh, I'm of the view he expected and believed the person coming through the door was a police officer and he thought he was shooting a policeman. And then when he recognized uh, that it was his I girlfriend. Was, I was basing my question on the fact <coughs> that you said that he had hugged her and yes. fired the shot. And in a case like that, there would have been internal powder burns. On a contact wound, you get well, no, 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 powder I, no. right wasn't, in the wasn't the to be contact. Well, you get him. I'm sure he could do it. He did it with the jury, and I, <laughs> I had trouble with it. But no, it wasn't contact, but it was awfully close. One which would have certainly left external burns. And uh, but you may be right. Perhaps I should have explored on the issue of internal burns. I don't know. Did I? There you go. All right. It's been a long time. I'm still ago. lost, eh, Mike? <laughs> still lost. Chris, have you got any comment? Thank you. As far as uh, an expert. Uh, I note here in uh, the outline, the issue is, or the question is, how would you attack an expert, qualification, scientific basis? I really, as a Crown, have limited experience in cross-examining experts except psychiatrists and uh, a couple of 
forensic pharmacologists. I've never had the opportunity to cross-examine a pathologist or a handwriting examiner or uh, a fingerprint examiner. But if you are going to cross-examine an expert, you have to really prepare yourself and try and find out as much as possible about that particular field of expertise. With very few exceptions, you will never know as much as the expert. But you can learn by having an expert of your own and having that expert teach you as much as is possible before the trial. You should also, whatever possible, interview the expert that you are going to cross-examine. There is, of course, the best way to discredit an expert is catch him in some outlandish claim or comment. I had uh, a very great luck in one case where the accused stabbed the deceased 47 times. There was no doubt that he was under the influence of alcohol. The question was, how much under the influence of alcohol? Uh, after the stabbing, he took the deceased, put him in the trunk of the deceased's car, covered him up with some old clothing, took him to a dump nearby, <coughs> dumped the body out, covered it up with various debris, then he drove back to Toronto, which was a distance of some 70 or 80 miles, stopped at the outskirts, telephoned his wife, and asked her to pick him up. He left the car parked on the side of Highway 401. The defense was that he was so drunk that he was unable to form the necessary intent. And there was evidence which was not disputed that he had consumed substantial amounts of alcohol. I uh, was cross-examining the psychiatrist who was giving evidence, and I was asking him how could a person substantially, <coughs> I'm sorry, also when he came back to the emergency, he also washed the walls and tied it up, washed the floor from the blood. There was very little blood ostensibly left at the scene. And I asked him how a person who was substantially under the influence of alcohol, how could he plan the concealment? How could he think about washing the blood of the walls and of the floor? And uh, the good doctor looked down at me. And I might say that the accused was uh, of Polish extraction, as am I. And uh, he looked down at me and he said, to quote, well, the accused Belong, belongs to an ethnic group which is able to consume large amounts of alcohol <laughs> and while being able to act physically is unable to act to form any intention. Now that is just as about outlandish a thing as you'll ever hear. Uh, I looked at him and I said, doctor, being a member of that ethnic group I cannot but disagree with you. And we went from there. The judge, I, I think he was laughing because he covered his face, his shoulders were shaking. Defense counsel was very embarrassed and everybody else laughed. Uh, now, when you're fortunate enough to have an expert making a rather outlandish statement like that, then don't overdo it. But uh, <coughs> I think you have reasonable grounds for attacking uh, his competence as an expert. Another thing that you can do is try and find out about the basis for his opinion. Is there sufficient basis for what he is telling you? Are there any variables that he didn't take into consideration? Uh, if, it's another case that I had, I was fortunate enough to know that in a conference between these experts, the expert indicated he held a certain view. Three weeks later, he was in a witness box expounding a totally opposite view. Uh, 
since I was in a position to prove the other view, I asked him whether he held an opposite view three weeks before. And that, I think, might have had something to do with the way the jury viewed him. I uh, was still, the accused was still only found guilty of manslaughter, but when his lordship was charging the jury, he took great care not to mention that particular expert at all to the jury. He mentioned uh, two others, but he did not mention him. So, again, it's a question of luck. In that particular case, that the case that I mentioned to you, uh, the expert, for some reason, and quite unnecessarily, I would think, was moved to make an outlandish comment. In another case, I was fortunate enough to know that he held an opposite view only three weeks before. Uh, I don't think that unless you're very brilliant or extremely knowledgeable in a given field, I don't think you will successfully uh, demolish an expert with a frontal attack. You can only cross-examine and see if there are any contradictions. You confront the expert with them. Uh, you can, for example, with a psychiatrist, how much of an opportunity did a psychiatrist have to view uh, the subject and see if you can make any yards on that? Uh, I really don't think I can say anything more. Do you have any assistance? I once uh, saw a cartoon that I think is very apt to describe to you. It uh, showed a witness in the box, and the clerk was handing him the Bible, and he said, well, that's not necessary. I'm an expert. <laughs> <coughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think that really sums up my view of, of experts that are called in criminal matters. Um, it's no uh, reflection on Dr. Jaffe what I'm about to say because I have a, a very deep respect for Dr. Jaffe. He is a true scholar in his field. Uh, he always uh, questions and he has a very probing mind. And I think in terms of preparing uh, for trials, uh, uh, he's an extremely useful aid uh, in terms of reviewing the autopsy report. But I would recommend that you read the two books. Uh, one written by Dr. Keith Simpson, his autobiography that was published about a year ago, and one by Dr. Milt uh, Helpern, who was the former uh, chief coroner in New York, called Autopsy. If you read those two books, you will see that uh, these two world-renowned experts, uh, Simpson, in fact, testified in the Truscott matter, um, are more arrogant than even lawyers can be. Uh, they're petty, uh, inflexible, and often wrong, but they maintain positions as a result of the fact that they are called in, in the first instance, by the um, investigating officers. And a theory may well be presented to them before they go into the autopsy room. And again, no, no reflection on, 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 on police officers, but a theory is presented, and then the expert goes in to not create or not to mold, but to view that autopsy in a certain way that will, I don't know how any human being can avoid being biased by what uh, a group of senior homicide officers say in their view happened, but the autopsy report will reflect <coughs> in large measure that view, a view that they then become fixed with and a view that they then present in court. Um, and I do not accept uh, any report that I get without having an expert independently examine that report and independently examine the testimony at the preliminary inquiry uh, to determine whether or not what that expert is saying uh, is in fact uh, valid. Uh, because I think that the important thing with all kinds of experts is to assume that there are, their assumptions are wrong. To begin with that premise that they are wrong until proven to your satisfaction that they're right. I disagree uh, very much with Chris when he says that you cannot make a frontal attack on, Wix, uh, on, on experts, because I think a lot of the experts that are called really aren't experts uh, at all in the field. And, and comment, we've fallen into a whole um, attitude with experts that people from the Center of Forensic Science come in and testify about things that they are totally unqualified to testify about and have no right to come into court and say that uh, 
uh, in their opinion, this or that, uh, that occurs. Toxicologists, I think, from the Center of Forensic Science fall into, into that, that category, or biologists as well. Uh, and it's important to, uh, uh, and it's not that difficult, uh, you know, because a lot of them have had a one year or a Bachelor of Science degree. Well, that's not all that hard to get. Most lawyers have, if not all lawyers, have a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science degree. Uh, and all they've done for the next 10 or 15 years is do the same kind of test. And their expertise is based on the fact that they've now done a thousand of these tests. But it doesn't mean that because they've done a thousand tests, uh, and I, oftentimes crowns will say you've testified at all levels of court. Well, I, I won't permit that uh, to be asked of, a, of an expert. Who cares whether he's testified uh, a thousand times in courts or crowns have fallen into the pattern of saying your evidence has been accepted. Actually, I've heard that from Crown Attorneys that your evidence has been accepted in all levels of court. Well, you know, that's, that's ridiculous. And that's, that's the kind of thing that, in terms of the attitude, that the expert is always right. Uh, the Center of Forensic Science is a place where they welcome, they say that they're an independent laboratory and the defense has a right to, uh, uh, to go and have a report made, if it wants a report made. Uh, well, the important thing about the Center of Forensic Science is, is that if the Crown uh, has a test made, the Crown gets the report. If the defense has a test made, the defense gets the report, and the Crown gets the report. That is not an independent lab. And I think that when the Crown attempts to advance somebody from the Center of Forensic Science as an independent expert, that I always uh, raise that point uh, and, and ask them in cross-examination about the, the independence of their laboratory um, and say that had I come to you for a test, then the Crown would have gotten a copy. Isn't that correct? But if they come to you, I don't get a copy. You call that independent. Um, and I think it makes a point, and a point that, that should be made, that these are, these are all kinds of reports that, that have to be questioned. Uh, and the underlying assumptions, uh, as I said, uh, when you look at them, and it's not that difficult. In, in one case that I was involved in, and that's why I, I disagree with Chris, that, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert. I, I really know very little about science. Um, but in one case I was involved in where um, a toxicologist came to court and took the position that a, a certain test, a phenolphalan test, um, was, uh, was sufficient to show an indication of blood um, on a coat. And it would have been very damaging if, in fact, this coat had indications of blood on it. Uh, well, you know, the big thing that I did was simply this. I, I decided to find out what this phenolphalan test was. So I went to the leading text, and all the leading text said, be very cautious, this is not a test for blood. Yeah. Now, it didn't mean that I couldn't frontally attack this man who was an expert in his field, who had a couple of years of university, with all the leading texts that say, you know, you're dead wrong, this is not a test for blood. It's not a test for the indication of blood, it's the test for the indication of uh, peroxidases. And I don't even understand what that means. Okay? <laughs> But I could show them uh, books on peroxidases and say it could have been a thousand things. And I think that quite often you can frontally attack an expert. Um, one of the things I would say, though, that if you're going to do it um, and you need an expert to prepare you to do it, make sure you have that expert in court with you. Uh, I once had a trial where I cross-examined a psychologist, and my own psychologist had set up a beautiful cross-examination for me uh, to challenge this man on an, M on an MMPI a test, and he prepared a graph for me, and uh, the, pathology, the psychologist couldn't be there that day, but it didn't matter because I was ready. And I started cross-examining the psychologist, and I asked him a question, and he refused to answer it because the graph I was showing him didn't have, and I didn't know what he was talking about, but it didn't have a certain number on it. I was completely stymied in my cross-examination. I asked for an adjournment and ran out and called the psychologist on the phone and yelled at him that he had left me in the courtroom, quite embarrassed with this, so he gave me the answer and I ran back in uh, after the recess and cross-examined. I think it was very apparent to everybody I didn't know what I was talking about. But <laughs> had I had the psychologist there, I could have very kind of casually as I was questioning him, even though inside I was uh, um, ready to pass out out of embarrassment, I could have walked over to my psychologist and, and said to him, Where do I, what do I do? <laughs> uh, and, make it look like I knew what I was doing, that I was just checking, checking something with a psychologist. So my tendency is to have the expert in court. If it is truly an expertise that, I, that I'm unfamiliar with and that I'm cross-examining on, uh, I will have my expert uh, sit with me. 
so that if I run into trouble, he's there. Because I can see there are areas where you can, you can really be beaten by somebody who is a, uh, a very qualified expert. Claire? I think the, uh, both Chris Meinhardt and Dr. Jaffe have both, at least inferentially, referred to, and Eddie directly, the important thing in cross-examination of experts is to attack the assumptions. They really are on a grade of certainty and often are inaccurate. Another thing to do is to recognize that most of the experts put forward are persons who at least purport to expertise and have done a great deal of writing in their field. And it does not do you ill to check them. They are in libraries and can be found and can be read. And it's amazing when you can put to an expert something which he has written in a learned journal uh, and suggests that it's rather different than from that which he is now doing. I'll give you an example in a pornography case in which I was involved. And the op opposition's leading doctor was a, uh, a probably a world-renowned uh, psychiatrist. I had uh, done some reading in his, uh, in his own writings and also had uh, culled the newspapers, uh, the clipping services, to find out things he had said. And my view, he was advancing the cause of what I considered to be a, a pornographic uh, book. Uh, you've heard of it. It's Show Me, um, uh, which I took to be a penthouse for pedophiles and not a learned treatise. And he, uh, he was advancing the cause. My view of this doctor was that he was experimental at any cost. And in my readings, I'd found out that the fellow was one of those in the 60s who had been experimenting with the use of LSD on his patients. So uh, I took a shot at it. Now, I didn't know as much as I got, but among other articles, I put to him a, a newspaper article which uh, reported on, on his experimentation with LSD. And the man, who was really brilliant, there's no question about it, and truly learned, exploded on the stand. And he said, but God damn it, he said, I didn't know she'd jump out of that window. And I said, doctor, neither did I. <laughs> and I sat down. <laughs> so um, in any event, if I may quote myself with approval, uh, I <laughs> You always do. <laughs> A recently published judgment of my own in the Canadian criminal cases, uh, not yet bound, but in the unbound uh, uh, weeklies, is Regina and United Ceramics. It's an Industrial Safety Act death case in which I deal with the role of the expert witness, and in that case, specifically, an engineer who purported to, uh, to be a very great expert indeed. As a judge, I am, I suppose, jealous of my function, and I suggest to you that you might use that jealousy, which is natural to any person in any position, uh, uh, to try to show that from time to time, and altogether too often in my respectful view, the experts try to assume the role of the judge. You see that particularly, I feel, in the area of psychiatrists, but it's not unique to them. And if you can sell the judge or the jury on the view that really what's happening in this trial is that Dr. So-and-so is trying to decide this case for you, you may well have great success. And uh, I know that the defense in the case in which I wrote judgment had a very great success indeed, because that's precisely what I assumed was occurring. And, uh, and I, I, I launched a fairly vigorous attack in my judgment on the expert. Wally, um, we want to discuss very briefly the um, business of disclosure. Um, what is the police? Uh, attitude or approach towards defense counsel, the percep perception of defense lawyers with respect to this very important area of disclosure? Well, it depends on the lawyer. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of defense counsel uh, accept what they get. In fact, in many cases, in homicide in particular, they're given the whole crown brief. And they will go over it with the crown attorney and they will ad admit certain evidence which cuts down on trial time but in some cases there's terrible abuses of it in one recent case uh, approximately two years ago a defense counsel gave a copy of the brief to the accused man who was in the trauma jail 
That brief had the address and phone number of every witness, and it was passed around the cell block for everybody to read. And I don't think that any defense counsel should go that far with full disclosure. Chris? Yes, you. Uh, before uh, I get to disclosure, for the first time in my experience, Eddie has been a little less than kind and fair. As far as the Center of Forensic Sciences, you have to remember when the first reports are prepared, there generally is no defense counsel of record. I would like to ask Eddie whether he has ever been refused a report from the Center of Forensic Sciences. Yes. <laughs> well, I certainly will, uh, would like to know what case and what basis. Two days ago. Because in my experience, mm -hmm. that has never happened. Two days ago, in a case called Garen. They refused to provide you mm -hmm. with a report. Mm -hmm. What no, was the reason? I'll get it in court. What would be the reason? Well, I, I mean, I don't think we should really get into it now. I think that we have a different position as to the independence and the fairness of the Center of Forensic Science. Well, I think we do. Because I have, in my experience, there has never been any forensic report that has not been made available to defense counsel. Now, as far as disclosure, I think it works if two counsel get together, the defense counsel finds out what the Crown's case is, and then he makes decisions to what admissions to make. Now, admissions aren't simply useful to you as counsel as far as shortening the case, because really that in itself should never be a consideration. But you can, in many cases, admit the Crown literally out of court. There is, when evidence is not called on a crucial issue and simply something is put to the jury, if the Crown permits it to happen that way, then the effect of the evidence is blunted. So when you are receiving disclosure and you have the facts as the Crown discloses to you, and then you check them because quite often, any of you who have had any substantial number of trials, you will find that the evidence is never quite what it is in a brief. It may be less, it may be more. And uh, so it is incumbent on you as defense counsel to check and double check the important pieces of evidence. If uh, you in fact say I agree that this particular person was killed in this manner, if your defense, for example, is uh, <coughs> drunkenness, uh, yes, I'm prepared to admit that my client did this, then, and let's draft an agreed statement of fact, I think your chance of being successful are much greater than when the whole case, uh, with all the color, goes before a jury. As far as making a total and complete disclosure, I would not do it in all cases. If it's, let's say, for argument, say, gangland killing, and you have witnesses that you have reason to believe will be harmed if their names become known. If a counsel is prepared to undertake to you that he will not disclose those names to his client, I don't know if he can, you'd be in better position to know that, then I would be loath to tell defense counsel the names and addresses, and sometimes even the evidence, because if there was a limited number of people to the knowledge of the accused at the scene, if you tell the defense that you're going to lead certain evidence, and if he speaks to his client about it, it won't be long before the accused knows exactly who the witness is, and the witness may no longer be there when preliminary hearing or trial comes along. Uh, but my view of disclosure is two counsel getting together, finding out, defense counsel finding out what the case is, and then doing away with proof of certain mundane things like continuity if 
you are satisfied that the Crown indeed can prove it. Is there anything else you want to no. touch on? I think had Chief Justice Evans been here tonight, one of the themes that he wanted to uh, discuss was the uh, pretrial uh, disclosure process in the Supreme Court where all murder cases are tried. Um, it is a very useful procedure uh, in that it uh, compels both sides, especially in cases where there really isn't a free flow of information uh, from both sides, uh, to get together and where the court uh, can impose disclosure because of the problems that will occur at trial. If there isn't disclosure, then the, the defense is entitled to a, a reasonable period of uh, uh, an adjournment in order to properly prepare to cross-examine. Uh, and this method that's been used, and as uh, the Chief Justice would have advanced uh, before you, um, is one that the defense counsel can use uh, uh, as a method of, of trying to obtain the uh, fair disclosure so that the case can, can proceed. Also, so that the issues can be narrowed. And they're finding that it's a, it's a very good exercise in the sense that it forces both sides to sit down and determine what are the issues that are really at stake. Uh, if the defense is self-defense, uh, then there are all kinds of extraneous issues that shouldn't be uh, uh, denied or that you could make admissions to under Section 582 of the Criminal Code uh, and get down to what the essential issue is. I come back to what I said at the beginning and finish off this way that the more often you can get to the jury what the theory of the defense is, and what the, or it's not popular now to call it the theory of the defense, but what the defense is, um, the more likely it is that that defense will sit with the jury and uh, make an impact on them. Uh, and if you spend four days on matters of uh, identification of the scene and photographs and various things that have nothing to do with what your essential defense is, you're not getting that home to the jury. Clear? Well. <clears throat> in my guise as Chief Justice Evans, I was involved at the inception of the uh, disclosure proceedings in the Supreme Court. In fact, when Mr. Justice Hart, uh, he, he was the justice who, who started it, and I was on the Crown staff, and I began the system uh, under the instructions of Peter Rickaby. I think it's been a, a tremendously uh, effective system that has inured to the benefit of the defense of every bit as much as it has the Crown. Uh, as a judge, I, I'm of the view that uh, good counsel rarely do other than deal with the real issues in the case. There are cases when it is at all, they are as, as spare as the case allows. And uh, as a judge, it allows me to know what the devil is going on. And I'm sure juries like to be in that position as well. So I, I'm fully in support of the disclosure system as imposed by the Supreme Court and hope to see it throughout the courts. Well, it's 7.20. Uh, uh, gentlemen, oh, I think Mike's going to thank everybody. Thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Next week, we're going to be <laughs> talking about fraud. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of you in uh, expressing my sincere thanks uh, to the excellent panel discussion. I personally found it to be both entertaining and educational, and I thank very much uh, all of the panelists for the presentation.